I had an opportunity once to sit in business class on a flight. Before then, I had only heard what business class was like. I'd only heard that business class had better service than economy, but I did not know what that looked like. Sure, you would walk through business class, you see the nice leather chairs, they're bigger than the chairs in the back, but I heard they had better service, but I had no idea what that actually looked like. But on that flight, I got a glimpse, I got a glance of what better service meant. Like, did you know that in business class, they ask you what you would like to drink before the plane takes off? <laughs> I was surprised. I wasn't even set. I had not even sat down yet when the flight attendant came and said, sir, would you like something to drink? I was just so thrown off by that. You know, economy doesn't get drinks until the plane is in the air and they might run out of what you want before you get it. But on business class, you get first dibs. It's better service. Now, I don't know if they still do that. I only rode business class once more. But for that experience, from that experience, business class, better service was not just a concept anymore. I got to see what better service looked like as I sipped on my ginger ale before the plane took off until they sent me back to economy, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> now, getting on business class is not something that's accessible to everybody, and I don't know if I'm ever going to do that again, but have you ever wondered, I tell you something accessible to all of us, have you ever wondered what a life of giving thanks looks like? Because, especially this month, you can hear a lot about being thankful and feeling thankful. And maybe you don't have a picture of what a life of giving thanks to God, especially in all circumstances, actually looks like in practice. Right? Is Thanksgiving only getting together with friends and family and having a meal? Is that what it is? Or is there something more? What does a life of giving thanks to God in all circumstances actually look like lived out? That's what I want to tell you today from Scripture, that I see what that kind of life can look like. We've been in this message series during the month of November called How Giving Thanks Transforms Us for Good. It is based on 1 Thessalonians 5.18, which says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So two weeks ago, we looked at how giving thanks displaces a me-centered life. Then last week, we looked at how giving thanks encourages a God-centered life. Life And today in this last message of this short series, I want us to look at what a life of giving thanks to God in all circumstances actually looks like in practice. I offer to you two examples of that from the scriptures today. Then I share how it is you can live this life continually and then end with some practical applications. So what does a life of giving thanks to God in all circumstances look like? Like First of all, it is a life where what you say and what you do resembles what Jesus would say and what Jesus would do. It's a life where what you say and what you do resembles what Jesus would say and what Jesus would do. Colossians 3.17, it says this, Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. The Apostle Paul, he's writing this letter to a church in the city of Colossae, and he wrote to them to applaud their focus on Jesus. He never met them, actually, but he was writing this letter to say, hey, kudos, good job. You guys are so focused on Jesus Christ, especially in the midst of all the pressures they were facing. And he also wrote them to remind them to be thankful for what Jesus had done in their lives. But paired together with that thankfulness, the feeling of thankfulness, was Paul's call to them to live a life different from the people around them who did not know Jesus. And that different life was to be a life where whatever they said and whatever they did, they did and said in the name of the Lord Jesus. What does it mean? to do something, say something in the name of Jesus. I think it means that you bring honor to Jesus by saying or doing what Jesus would say or do. And I get that because doing something in the name of somebody means you take on their identity. Now you know that you can take on someone's identity and dishonor them, right? 
and do stuff that they would never say and do. Like you probably heard of people who get their email and credit card accounts and bank accounts and Facebook accounts hacked. You've heard of hackers, and this is what hackers do. They take on the identity, the name of the people whose accounts they hack into, and then they do things that those people wouldn't do, right? Like they would buy 100,000 teddy bears. I don't know, right? Like I would never do that, but somebody did that in my name. Now this identity theft, this hacking thing kind of happened to me. Somebody used my email address, and I don't know how they got it, but someone used my email address to make their personal account for a taxi service in a country on the other side of the world. Now, at first, I thought it was a joke. You know, it was spam mail. But then I started to regularly get receipts and travel itineraries for this taxi service, like Uber, right? I would get emails every other week, like, this guy went from this town to this town and had to pay this much. And after a while, I realized, you know what? This is a legitimate taxi service. And I Googled it. It's a legitimate taxi service in that country. And I thought, you know what? I'm sure at some point this guy will realize that he's got the wrong email because he's not getting his receipts. He has no idea how much money he's spending. I do, but he doesn't. But after a while, my email address didn't change, and I kept getting these emails. So I just started enjoying getting these emails. I thought, whoa, he took another trip today. I'm glad he's doing well. He's alive, right? This is in the middle of the pandemic. You know, he's getting, he's sending these, I'm sending, I'm getting these emails. But because he used my email to somebody casually looking on, it might look like that I was the one hopping on a cab in a different country. He was doing things in my name. Now, it's not possible because during the pandemic, remember, we couldn't get out of this country, right? Now, this doesn't necessarily dishonor me. It's just not me. I don't live in that country. But you can imagine how hackers might dishonor you if they get a hold of all your personal accounts and they would act in your name. But you can also imagine how you can take on somebody's identity and honor them by what you say and do. Like if you had to be somebody's representative for their health or for their death, maybe of power of attorney or medical power of attorney, you act in their place with their identity in their name, and you honor them by saying or doing what they would say or do. And usually you do this for somebody you love, someone who has loved you, and you do it to honor them because you are grateful for them their impact in your life, and their trust in you. So the Apostle Paul, when he calls the church to say and do in Jesus' name, he's telling them to honor Jesus by saying and doing what Jesus would do because they're thankful for what Jesus has done in their lives. A life of giving thanks does and says what Jesus would do and say, friends, how do your words and deeds show Jesus? Now there's more to this. Please notice Paul says that whatever we do, we do it all in the name of Jesus. And that means whatever. It means big things and small things. Things people see, things people do not. The call is everything we do to do it in the name of Jesus. I don't know about you, but it's much easier sometimes for me to do big things, noticeable things in ways that honor God. It is not as easy sometimes to do small things in that way. I was reading in my devotions this week, and this passage, this paragraph came up. It said, it's one thing to go through a crisis grandly, yet quite another to go through every day glorifying God when there's no witness, no limelight, and no one paying even the remotest attention to us. The true test of a saint's life, and by saint, it doesn't mean Catholic saint, It means anybody who's been forgiven by Jesus and is following him. The true test of a saint's life is not successfulness, not in the big things, but faithfulness on the human level of life. As I was reading this, I was reminded, Jesus lived the mundane small life for 30 years. He was in public ministry where everybody saw what he did for only three years. 
So he spent 10 times more time in the small things, obeying his parents day after day, helping dad with carpentry work, cleaning up the house, setting the table, putting things away, right? Living the regular, mundane, small life to honor his heavenly father 10 times more than public ministry. And as I read this and I was reminded of these things, I had to sit down and I had to reflect, how am I doing the small things in my life? The mundane things, the washing dishes, the cleaning toilets, you know, the small things that nobody sees. The conversations with one person, the brief ones that I'll never probably see again, this person. Am I doing and saying things as Jesus would do and say them? And I offer that question to you this morning to you as well. Where do you need in word or deed to say or do as Jesus would say or do? in the big things and in the small things. A life of giving thanks in all circumstances to God looks like a life where whatever you do and say resembles what Jesus would do and Jesus would say. Second, a life of giving thanks in all circumstances to God looks like a life of giving so that there is thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians 9, 10 to 12, it says this, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, that's God, will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge your harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. What's going on here is the Apostle Paul is writing to the church in the city of Corinth, another city, a different church. And the context is he's reminding them of a financial commitment they made to help people in need in the church of Jerusalem. He encourages them and reminds them that God will provide for them. They're going to be enriched in every way so that they can be generous. They're being given so they can give. Have you noticed that when you're grateful for getting a gift, many times you just naturally give to other people? You're so grateful, you just give back. In one of the churches I served, one day, a refrigerated truck pulled into the parking lot. And none of us on staff were expecting any deliveries, so I went out to greet the driver and see if he needed help. Maybe he just had driven a lot of hours and needed a break. When I got there, he was on the phone. He gets off the phone and he tells me that he has hundreds of pounds of frozen chicken wings in the trailer. Apparently, there had been some confusion between the supplier and the recipient. The recipient rejected the delivery, and the supplier did not want it back. So the driver is stuck. He's sitting on hundreds of pounds of frozen chicken. What's he going to do with all this? He tells me that he's cleared to donate it to the church if we want it. And I was like, if we want it? <laughs> yes, please, right? Thank you. Right? And guess what? It was the big, chunky kind of chicken wings, not the dinky little one. You know what I'm talking about? You go to some places, they got huge chicken wings. You go to other places, like, that's a chicken wing, Right? It's just bones. Anyway, he's got these big, huge chicken wings. And as he's unloading the chicken wings, all of our staff are like, we got to get on the phone. we got to call people. Who needs this food? Who just likes chicken? Right? And so we're calling everybody. And that night, a lot of people had chicken, at least in their freezers. We were thankful for this unexpected, random gift. And guess what? That thankfulness resulted in generosity. And so Paul tells the Corinthians, hey, God's going to provide for you so that you can be generous. But I want you to notice that Paul says that the Corinthians' generosity is not just going to supply needs for people, it's going to result in thanksgiving to God. People will give thanks to God because the Corinthian church gave. The gifts of the church would change the lives would change the trajectories, the spiritual lives, the stories of people in Jerusalem. And friends, the same is true today. When you give, you change people's 
lives. You change people's stories for good. I want to share one example with you on video. Please watch with me this video about how a simple gift of a shoebox changes the life of one man. I've had a, an interesting upbringing. In my journey, I've experienced God's love in the form of people reaching out when they don't have to, to tangibly demonstrate God's love. That love along the way has been unconditional, never ending, generous, always giving, powerful love that has changed hearts and most personally, my, my very own. My family is originally from Rwanda. In July of 1994, a lot of the you know, chaos started and uh, uh, Hutus were killing Tutsis, Tutsis killing Hutus. My mom was eight months pregnant. They had just built a new house, and my dad realized that with two young boys and one daughter, they need to get out. And that's when they decided to flee to the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And I was born a month later there. Then after that, we bounced around the world because we had nowhere else to go. And that's when we moved to Togo. So I was a refugee for 14 years of my life. I've never met any of my my grandparents, uh, my uncles, my cousins, many of them were, were killed. And it's not just my family. A million people fell in the span of 100 days in the Rwandan genocide. Knowing that fact broke me as a kid. I was weary of humanity because I knew what they were capable of, the evil they were capable of. And I harbored a hatred for them, a radical hatred for them. I grew up calling myself a Christian, uh, but my faith wasn't my own. It was my, my parents. My parents there were, were pastors in Togo and uh, heard the gospel, read the Bible, but none of it re reached me, really. Because of hardened heart, pride, just hatred. Over and over, I walked away from God's love. But he, he was always there. You know, something that changed the course of my life was my first gift, the first gift I'd ever received. As I opened the shoebox, the items in there were incredible. The first thing I remember pulling out was a scarf, a scarf that I still have. There was a red toy car in my box. That was my favorite item that day. At the very top was a sticky note. The words on that sticky note read, God loves you, Jesus loves you, I love you. Now, I had heard the first two lines before, but that last one wrecked me because it was an I love you from a member of that very humanity I grew up hating. And they were telling me essentially, Eve, despite your hatred for me, I love you anyway, man. And here's proof of my love for you in the form of the first and only gift you've ever received. That shook my world to the core. that sticky note to start working on my heart. It didn't happen overnight. I'm still a work in progress. His love never left our side. It is ever flowing, never ending, always giving, generous, powerful love. And then a shoebox gift. That's what God used to free me from the burdens of hatred. I have never been the same because of that shoebox that still continues to change my life. How awesome is that, right? Praise God for stories like that. 
And we pray that the shoeboxes that we collected would have impact for Jesus also. But this is not just about shoeboxes. Rather, I am talking about what a life of giving thanks to God looks like. It looks like a life of giving that results in more thanksgiving to God. So your giving can change people's stories for good. Friends, how can you give and what can you give to give thanks to God from you and to inspire giving thanks to God from others? These are the two examples that I offer to you of what a life of giving thanks looks like. It looks like saying and doing what Jesus would say and do, and it looks like a life of generous giving. Well, how do you live this life continually, constantly? Because anybody can give once, can say one good thing, can do one good thing, but a life that does this constantly and continually in all circumstances? Surely when God is speaking through Paul and he's writing this, and he's, Paul is writing things like give thanks in all circumstances, Paul's not talking about just once. He's talking about a life that does this. Where does that kind of life come from? Well, here's what Paul writes in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 to 7. He writes, So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. A life that overflows with thankfulness comes from two things. It comes from where you're rooted And it comes from how your life is being built up. So first, it begins with being rooted in Jesus. Your life's fruit begins in your life's roots. If deep down you're rooted in resentment or anger, your life is going to bear the fruit of that resentment or anger. Or if you deep down you're rooted in feeling inferior to others, your life is going to bear fruit by maybe you trying to prove yourself all the time. You've got to have more than others. You've got to do better than others. You can't stand being around other people. You can't celebrate good things that happen to other people. Why? Because you've come from this root of feeling inferior. But if you're deep down rooted in the grace of God and Jesus Christ for, for you, then what can overflow from your life is thankfulness. Thankfulness. Right? You see the messed up face now, the messed up mouth, right? The heart over here, the water has gone all the way to the top. Your life's fruit begins in your life's roots. Think about those chicken wings. Those chicken wings were an incredible surprise for us. But with regards to the chicken wings, we were neither deserving of them or undeserving of them. We were deserving neutral. They're just a random happening that happened out of nowhere. And yet we enjoyed them, gave thanks for them, and shared them as much as we could. Well, if that's how we respond to chicken wings, how much more do we respond with gratefulness to the grace of God in Jesus Christ? The scripture reminds us in Romans 5.8, God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God gave his son for us, not when we had it all together, not when we were perfect, not when we could say we deserved anything, but when we were still messing up, when we were still in our sins and in our brokenness, when we could not do differently, God loved us and gave his son for us on a cross, and then that son, Jesus, rose again so we could be forgiven and healed and live closely with him forever. Nothing we did deserves this. It is the gracious love of God for you and for me. And if random chicken wings generate an overflow of thanksgiving, how much more can the grace of God undeserved result in an overflow of thanksgiving to God? The root of overflowing gratefulness is God's graciousness. But that's not all. It's not just the root. It's how you live. A life overflowing with thankfulness comes from a life lived in Jesus, is what Paul is saying. Live your lives in him. What does that mean? You know, sometimes we think our relationship with God is something we visit from time to time. So if you messed up, you come to God for forgiveness. If you need help, 
you come to God for help. It's like a hospital. That means if everything is going okay and you're doing okay, God is not really part of the picture of your life. Why would you go to the hospital if you're feeling fine? And so if God is not on your mind because everything's going okay, then it's no wonder that giving thanks to God is not on your mind either. And if giving thanks to God is not on your mind, then overflowing with thankfulness is not going to be there in your life either. That's why Paul, he does not tell the church in Colossae to visit Jesus. Jesus is not your friend's house. Jesus is not your vacation spot. Jesus is not your hospital or doctor's office to visit occasionally. Instead, Paul tells them and he tells us, Live in him. If you live in your house or you're living in your car, you live daily trusting your house, trusting your car, taking care of what your house tells you to take care of, taking care of what your car tells you to take care of. If your dashboard says, gas empty, you go and fill up that tank. Right? If your refrigerator says, refrigerator empty, you go fill up that refrigerator. You obey, you trust, you follow the things you're living in. And so living in Jesus means daily trusting him, obeying him, following him, knowing him, becoming more and more like him. Many times we begin with the root of God's grace. We know God loves us, he forgives us. But sometimes we need to move on to living in him each day. What does that look like? Paul gets really specific in Colossians 3. He says, starting in verse 5, Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. And he goes on in verse 8, Rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips, Do not lie to each other. Very specific. And then Paul writes in verse 12 to 14, how followers of Jesus do live in him. And he says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in unity. Perfect unity. Please notice, he says to the Colossian church and to us, you are God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, already You're already holy, already loved through faith in Jesus who died for your sin and rose again. You're already clean. You're already his child. And so when you choose every day to live in Jesus instead of not living in Jesus, you know what you're doing? Every day you're remembering, God already loves me. God already calls me holy. God already has grace on me. I'm not who I used to be. So when you choose to forgive each day, you're remembering God has forgiven you. When you choose kindness each day, you're remembering God has been kind to you. When you choose gentleness, you're remembering God is gentle with you, patient with you, compassionate to you, loving to you, all by His grace. And the more you remember that grace each day, the more you just overflow with thanksgiving. That is how Paul, even though he's in prison writing this letter, he writes with thanksgiving. Because he knows God chose him. He knows God loves him. He knows God forgave him. For persecuting Christians, God forgave him. That's how you and I can live a life overflowing with thanksgiving by remembering each day, God forgave me. God loves me. God is with me all by his grace. And even if you mess up one day, you can go back to God, ask for forgiveness, and remember he gave his son for you. Remember his grace. And then again overflow with thankfulness that day. It's not about how good you are, this Christian life. It's really about how good God is. 
how gracious he is. And a life of overflowing gratefulness will begin with the root of God's grace and will continue when you keep living every day in that grace. So I invite you today to put your faith in Jesus and his grace to you. If you have not been a follower of Jesus to this day, I invite you to believe and follow Jesus starting today. He loves you. His grace is for you. He gave his life on a cross so that you and I could be forgiven of our sins, healed of our brokenness, and he rose from the dead so you can be in a close personal relationship with him forever. Turn from life without Jesus to life with Jesus to life having more of Jesus. It is not easy But his promise is he will be with you every step of the way. And you can do that by praying and asking God to forgive you, heal you, and help you to follow him each day. If you do that for the first time today, please tell somebody, tell me, and join a church family to to follow Jesus together with others. If you are a follower of Jesus, I invite you to remember every day the amazing grace of God for you. Your roots are Jesus. Your life is Jesus. And you grow by following his ways step by step. Even if you've stumbled this past week, God has more grace for you. Even if you've failed, there is more grace for you because Jesus paid for it all. Turn to Jesus and walk with him and his strength each and every day. And as you remember his grace, you will overflow with thanksgiving. I offer to you some practical ways that you can express this life of giving thanks to God. First, as I've shared in a previous message, go on a gratefulness walk. Once every season, twice every season, once a month maybe, just go out on a walk through nature, right? And just thank God. And as you thank God in the midst of your life, his promise is his peace. Second, take a moment to consider what aspect of your life needs to become more like Jesus. Is it your words? Is it your deeds? And get to know Jesus better so you know what he would say and what he would do. You can do that by going through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and asking the question, what's this guy like? What does he do in situations that happen? What does he say? And the more you get to know him, the more you can pray to God, God, help me to be more like Jesus. Third, I invite you to give continually as an expression of love and thanksgiving to God. Do you know, we collected 81 shoeboxes, I think. 80 or 81 this past week. It's 80. We counted 81, and when we got there, it was 80. So along the way, one disappeared. (laughs) Don't know. Maybe it just, poof, went, you know. So 80 shoeboxes this year. Now, we collected 63 last year. So I don't know what happened this year. But praise be to God. And that's not all. This past week, there was a flurry of responses to put together Thanksgiving meals for families in need. People come in for Bible study this past week. People brought in stuff. I gotta gotta do this. Where did this go? Right? And yesterday, we helped over 80 families in partnership with the First Moravian Church of Riverside with Thanksgiving food and personal hygiene products, right? To meet the needs of families. Uh, You know, grocery prices are up. And we got to do this. And not just that, I want to applaud you and thank you because it is your faithful, generous, sacrificial, regular giving that has sustained the ministries of this church even throughout this pandemic. And I want to tell you, you are such a generous and sacrificial congregation. And I'm proud. I'm proud and honored to be your pastor. I invite you, as we go into the holiday season, to consider your year-end giving. Maybe you can make a gift to the church so we can keep changing people's stories for good. I don't know who gives, and I don't know how much you give, but I know that you give because we're still here. (laughs) And we're still doing outreach. Maybe you have not given in the past, or maybe you paused for a while for whatever reason, and maybe you're looking at your finances and you're thinking, you know what, now's a good time to start giving again, start giving regularly. But however much God puts it in your heart to give, give with cheerful hearts. Give thanksgiving to God for what he's been doing in your life. 
Finally, I invite you to take a moment this season to really give thanks to other people. We talk all about being thankful, feeling thankful. Can you tell people, thank you? I close with some examples of this. One of you shared an article with me from the home magazine, Real Simple. And the article was titled, would you, Who Would You Like to Write a Thank You Note To? Some of the entries people wrote in responses to the magazine, and some of the entries are the following. Who would you like to write a thank you note to? My supervisor at my first factory job. She saw something in me and offered me the chance to work a desk job. She changed the trajectory of my life. Today, I own a business helping folks with disabilities achieve their goals. My stepdad, for the subtle lessons he taught me as a reliable, actions speak louder than words figure in my life. My daughter-in-law, she has given us our first grandchild and made sure our time with the baby is so special. My elderly mom's part-time caregiver, she is kind, patient, and responsible. She is a blessing to my mom and to me as well. What we don't know is whether they actually wrote these thank you notes because the article was titled, Who Would You Like to Write a Thank You Note To? Maybe they did. But you can bless somebody by giving thanks to someone this season. Not just giving thanks for someone, not just feeling thankful for someone, but actually thanking someone. Because you know what? Giving thanks is more than feeling thankful. It looks like something. And giving thanks to God means you say and do what Jesus would say and do. Giving thanks to God means you give so that there is more thanksgiving to God. And my hope is that whatever your circumstances, you would overflow with expressing your thanksgiving as you remember the grace of God in your life. Amen? Amen. Please close your eyes with me. I invite you now to consider the things that have come up in this message. How has God given you grace? How has God transformed your story? Where do you need God's grace today? He's got more grace for you, always. Where do you need God to change your story today? How can you honor Jesus with your words and deeds? How can you give so there's more thanksgiving to God? Please take a moment and spend some time, you and God, about these things.